thank you everyone for joining tonight's virtual town hall hosted by the city and county of Denver. My name is Angela Jo Wolcott and I will be your moderator tonight as we talk about the Denver Community Transportation Network project. But first, a quick word from our interpreter for the evening. Buenas tardes, gracias por acompañarnos en esta reunión municipal virtual acerca de la red de transporte comunitario. Para aquellos participantes que quieran ser transferidos al evento en español, por favor, pulse un asterisco cero en su teléfono. Si desean hacer una pregunta durante el evento, por favor, presionen asterisco 3 en su teléfono. Aquellos que estén participando en línea pueden escribir sus preguntas en la caja para preguntas en la página web del evento de Puertas Abiertas Virtual sobre las redes de transporte comunitario. Gracias. Great, thank you. I am joined tonight by a number of transportation experts from the city and county of Denver that you will be hearing from shortly. They include Jennifer Hillhouse, David Pulsifer, Riley Lemie, Geneva Hooten, and Sam Piper. We also are joined by Michael Koslow from the Department of Transportation and Infrastructure, who will be available later for any design-related questions that we may receive during the Q&A periods. So this is a great time to get started. We currently have well over 75 participants and it's growing. So thank you everyone for joining us. This is a conversation tonight about the community transportation networks. Some attendees tonight may have already joined us for a prior meeting and for others, this might be the first time that you're being introduced to this project. You can view some of the previous meeting recordings and meeting boards that we are currently about to post after tonight's meeting at the website accessed by going to bit.ly forward slash Denver Moves Networks. If you're dialed in by phone but would like to see the presentation we're referencing, you can go to www.ctnvirtualopenhouse.com and follow along. However, this is not required for the meeting. If you are watching online, you can double click the frame to make the presentation larger. We want this to be very interactive tonight, so if you would like to ask the panel a question, individuals on the phone can press star three on your keypad and you will be connected to an operator who will take down some basic information from you and then you will be returned to the call and you can listen to the conversation until it's your turn. Those of you participating online can type your question into the question box on the website. If you are viewing the presentation in full screen, just remember, you might need to minimize back to the normal view in order to access the question box. After the call, we'll review any questions that we weren't able to get to tonight, and we'll try our best to get all of those addressed on the project website in the FAQ document. So tonight, let me tell you a little bit about what we are going to cover. It's basically broken down by four main sections. First, we're going to provide some background and an overview of the community transportation network. A little bit further into the evening, we'll want to review different ways to engage with the project, including some upcoming meetings that we'll be hosting, and a new interactive tool or two that we'll be using to educate and collect feedback from community members like yourself. Around 5.45, we'll pause for the first Q&A session, and around 6 p.m., we'll discuss the bikeway project's process at a really high level and walk through the goals and outcomes for each of the project areas. Following our bikeway projects overview, we'll have a final Q&A session with the project team. Tonight, we'll wrap up with a quick reminder about how you can stay engaged. Now I'm going to turn it over to David Pulsifer, the pedestrian and bicycle planning super supervisor with the Department of Transportation and Infrastructure. David, would you like to introduce yourself and please get us started? Hi, everyone. You have lost David, Angela. Okay, thank you. I think Geneva was getting ready to jump in and speak. Is that correct, Geneva? Yes, that is. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming tonight to discuss community transportation networks. Before we get started, I just want to thank everyone for supporting the city as we are dealing with COVID and all of the public health and safety mitigations that everyone is taking. For the foreseeable future, all upcoming community meetings related to the community transportation networks will occur virtually. 
through a suite of accessible and engaging digital tools like this virtual meeting tonight. Thank you for joining us for the first time tonight and for those who have been ongoing participants in our community meetings and engagement tools, including an interactive map and survey that you'll, you will hear more about tonight. So for those who are joining us for the first time, let me provide some background on community transportation networks. We'll be concentrating in three areas of the city to plan for multimodal system improvements. We're calling these areas Central, Northwest, and South Central. Between now and 2023, the city plans to implement 125 miles of bikeways as a strategy to provide more efficient travel options. The first phase of implementation includes building out a bike network because we have funding for these projects. However, it's important to know that these bikeway projects will also benefit people walking, taking transit, and improve safety for anyone who's using our streets. And implementing 125 miles of bikeways sounds like a big undertaking, and it is. Our streets have changed drastically over the past few years, and even more recently, and continue to change. This is part of the city's response to all of these changing needs. It's really important for us to hear from community members about your needs and perspectives, which is why we're, we are committed to a robust, robust community engagement process for this program. We kicked off the process in April 2020 with a suite of public meetings, interactive tools, surveys, and small group meetings. In just a few short months, we've already heard from thousands of you, and we'll talk about how to stay engaged in just a few minutes. Right now, I'm gonna walk you through a few goals of this program. First is safety. We're committed to eliminating all traffic-related deaths and serious injuries throughout the city. The second is to encourage mode shift and to help people choose different ways of getting around. We're identifying a multimodal network that encourages people to take new ways of getting around, like biking, walking, transit, and getting that percentage to 30. Third, we're going to rapidly deliver low stress bikeways, meeting Denver's goal of delivering 125 miles of bikeways by 2023. Four, we're going to provide additional travel options. And five, we'll prioritize multimodal projects, integrating them into existing programs when feasible. And before we discuss the bikeway process and each area's plans, we first want to let you know about some new input opportunities for community transportation networks. Geneva, it's Angela, and I just wanted to let you know that David has joined us again. So we could introduce David to have him present the next couple of slides, if you would like. That's perfect, thanks. Great. David, we are okay. just about to talk about how to stay engaged and provide input. Go ahead. I'm with you. Okay, thanks everyone. We realize this, that this is a busy time for everyone, and if you're not able to be on the entirety of the meeting tonight, we wanted to remind you up front in presentation, in the presentation that there are a number of ways you can provide input. Next week, each area will be holding interactive virtual meetings to walk through the community input tools that will be open for comment and take a deeper dive into each area's proposed projects and next steps. South Central's meeting will be scheduled for next Tuesday, June 23rd from 5.30 to 6.30 p.m. The Northwest meeting is Wednesday, June 24th from 5.30 to 6.30 p.m. And the Central Area's meeting is on Thursday, June 25th from 5.30 to 6.30 p.m. We will be sending out email reminders in the days to come, and you can also find out this information on the project website. The best way to provide input on concept designs is to visit our website, review fact sheets and concept designs, and take surveys about each corridor. This too will be available between Monday, June 22nd, and Sunday, July 12th. The best way to stay on top of everything is to visit the project website where you can get information on what was shared tonight, provide feedback, and see what meetings we have coming up next. The website is bit.ly backslash Denver Moves Networks. We also, we also have a list of frequently asked questions on the project website that likely will answer some of the questions we didn't have time to, to get to tonight. This is also a good time for anyone on the phone to press star six and share your contact information with an operator to sign up for project updates. As I mentioned earlier tonight, one of the objectives of this initiative is to build out a complete network of bikeways to make it more comfortable to travel within the neighborhood on a bicycle. The first step in this process of planning for a complete network is to confirm the overall plan for connected bikeways within the area. 
You can think of the network as lines on a map. We want to make sure our plans show the lines in the right place on the map, the locations of those lines make sense, and that there are no missing lines. The next steps after network verification are to develop options for funding bikeways, developing a concept design, completing design, and finally, constructing the bikeway. It's important to know that each project will move through this process at its own pace, based on a variety of factors, including level of technical complexity, potential impacts, and public input. Right now, we're in stages two and three of this process. Some projects are moving forward into concept design, while we're taking more time on, on option development and analysis for others. This is an incredibly important time to gather input from the community, and we ask that you check the project website next week to review our story map and take the surveys we're making available for each project. Next, you're gonna hear from each, each area's project manager who will speak at a high level about what we've heard from the community and bikeway project ne next steps for that area. Great, thank you so much. Thanks Geneva and thank you, David. This is a good time for us to go ahead and pause and start our first Q&A session. So we do have a couple of other reminders before I take the first question. If you're dialed in by phone and have a question for us, press star three. Those of you participating online can type your question into the question box on the website. If you're viewing the presentation full screen, you may need to click back to the smaller view in order to access your question box. So we're gonna go ahead and take a question here about shared streets. So it looks like there's a question about if there are current shared streets that are closed to cars, is there an option to expand and consider additional options for uh, potential restaurants and other amenities in the area? So Jen Hillhouse, I'm going to hand that question over to you. Great. Thanks, Angela, and thanks for the question. Uh, we have received an amazing amount of support for our shared streets. Um, for those of you that are not familiar, the city has um, recently, you know, starting in April, um, closed some streets through to through traffic to provide more space for people to walk and bike and really provide additional recreation opportunities in a safe way um, due to the COVID crisis. Um, it, it's an amazing amount um, of support to really think and reimagine our streets to prioritize people instead of cars. Um, and as Geneva explained, is a high priority of the city. We are also um, working with the business improvement districts and other business owners to expand uh, retail and patio uh, tables and chairs into the right of way, again, to meet the needs of the business owners. Um, comply with the health order of staying six feet distance. And so we, I think we're up to over 300 permits into the city um, to provide this additional space and continue to work in a proactive way to understand how we can help the economy and further the business in our city. Thank you, Angela. Great. You bet. So we have another question here. It's coming in. Um, about questions about additional lanes. So some some interest and in questions about some of the streets being a little bit busier and options to try to keep the, the cars um, more separated from the people and the bikes. So if we could go ahead and turn to Sam Piper to help us answer the question here about what streets are we looking at for additional improvements, Sam? Yes, thank you. So through the community transportation networks, we are really looking for feedback about all the way that people move through the areas where this planning effort is taking place. And we do want to emphasize um, to Geneva's point that we are rapidly building out bicycle projects through this program. And so I think the question may be rooted in, well, how do we determine which streets to um, put bicycle facilities on. And I just wanted to note that Denver has had a robust planning process for bikeways that goes back nearly a decade. We completed our first bicycle master plan in 2011, and then we updated that plan in 2015. And as a quick primer for bicycle master planning, um, there is a technical process as well as a robust public outreach process where we're trying to connect the people, the places where people live, learn, work and play and access transit 
via a convenient, um, low stress and comfortable bicycle network. So when we look at our entire um, roadway network across Denver, those are the driving principles that we are using to identify which are the best corridors to place bicycle facilities along. And uh, while we do take a technical approach and we are looking at traffic speed and traffic volumes, both in 2011 and in 2015, we reached out to the public to test um, the validity of that technical analysis against where people preferred um, bikeways to be recommended along specific streets. And then we join those two elements together and that's how we develop a bicycle master plan. So the projects and the corridors that we're advancing through this program are not new. Um, they were first identified in that 2011 plan. They were refined and updated in 2015. And even when we developed Blueprint Denver, which is the city's land use and transportation plan, we again verified bicycle priority corridors through that planning process, which was wrapped up in 2018, 2019. And so now today we're moving from the planning phase into design. And so again, we're, we're verifying the network as we advance um, concepts into design to actually understand what um, the specific changes to the street would be. So that is how we um, select streets. It's a multifaceted process and we look forward to engaging you all as we um, transition from the planning phase more into the design phase. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. And for those of you that have just joined us, we're currently in our first Q&A period here. We have over 700 people that have now joined us. So thank you for being here with us tonight. We have time for another question before we go back to the presentation. And the question has to do with traffic calming and what is currently being considered to help slow traffic along neighborhood streets. So I'm going to go ahead and turn that one over to Riley. Riley, if you would like to answer that question, that would be great. Sure, thanks, Angela. So a lot of the projects that we're looking at today um, are something that's called a neighborhood bikeway or a healthy street. And these are types of projects where we'll be studying both the traffic volumes and speeds that we experience on the streets today and looking for ways that we can mitigate some of those issues um, through, through treatments that improve the street for all modes, whether that be biking, walking, or just uh, or for driving. Um, one of the goals, as Geneva mentioned earlier, of this project is to be able to better, is to improve modes for everyone and really improve how people travel um, within the neighborhoods. And that really starts with safety. So each of these projects is meant to address safety and how we can better improve them for everyone. Thanks, Angela. Great. You bet. Okay. Well, this has been a great Q&A period. Let's go ahead and we'll put a cap on that for now, but we'll come back to your questions. So please hold with us. I'm going to go ahead and turn it back to Riley Lamy to let him talk a little bit more about the central network tonight. Riley, go ahead. Thanks, Angela. So again, I'm Riley Lamy. I'm the planning project manager for the central area network, which covers the general boundaries of downtown. And it also includes the neighborhoods of Five Points Clayton, Skyland, Cole, and Whittier. I'll talk a little bit more about the benefits of the projects that we plan to implement in the central network in the coming slides. But as a reminder, our interactive virtual meeting is scheduled for June 25th from 5.30 to 6.30. So we hope that we can see you next week at that meeting again, that's from June, uh, June 25th from 5.30 to 6.30. When we first launched the community transportation networks, we asked the community to provide input through an interactive map tool to help us better understand how you move around your neighborhood and what opportunities you see to improve your experience. When we ask questions for the central network, both walking related suggestions and speeding, as well as intersection vi visibility suggestions bubbled up to the top as priorities. Both of these reflected 37% of the input that we got. Following those categories were bicycle related suggestions at 20%, with 6% of the suggestions that we heard being related to transit that were noted on the map tool. It's important to note, though, that the improvements that are going to be made through the community transportation network process 
will help improve how everyone travels, whether you're walking, rolling, taking transit, or driving a, a vehicle in addition to biking. So now I'm going to talk about some of the benefits in the central area that you'll see from a result of these projects. One of those I'm going to start with is adding high comfort bicycle and pedestrian connections to city park as well as different area schools in the neighborhood, as well as creating additional north south connections through the neighborhood that link neighborhoods as well as connect to the 39th Avenue Greenway. Additionally, being able to connect the East Area neighborhoods to downtown via bicycle connections is a benefit of a lot of the projects that we'll talk about. And then being able to fill in missing connections within the downtown area that is a benefit. And then finally, um, these projects, as I just discussed, will provide the opportunity for traffic calming, especially in key areas in residential streets. Next, I'm gonna hand it over to Geneva Hooten, who you heard from earlier, who's gonna talk more about the Northwest area. Thanks, Riley. Hi, everyone. I'm Geneva Hooten. I'm the planning project manager for the Northwest Community Network. And this covers all of Northwest Denver, including Jefferson Park, Sloan's Lake, Highland, West Highland, Sunnyside, Chaffee Park, and the Berkeley Regis neighborhoods. And I do hope that you can join us next Wednesday from 5.30 to 6.30 p.m. on June 24th. We're gonna dive into this network a bit more and talk about each of the corridors and more specifics. So I really hope that you can join us then. And thanks to everyone who provided input in April on this online map tool. In the Northwest area, 44% of the suggestions were categorized as walking related or pedestrian suggestions. And almost 30% were related to speeding and visibility, meaning that safety is a top priority for people. And close behind, a quarter were actually bike related. And so tonight, we're certainly talking a lot about bikes. Uh, but the Northwest Network is unique because of its development of neighborhood bikeways. And these, like Riley has talked about, are calm streets where walking and biking are prioritized. Uh, you are probably familiar with West 35th Avenue, one of the city's first neighborhood bikeways, and we'll be building lots more facilities like that. For this network, we're adding 15 miles of neighborhood bikeways, including Perry Street, Irving, Elliott, Clay, and 41st, which will improve our streets for people walking and biking, certainly improving access to schools and parks. This network will also provide a crucial north-south connection to link Regis to Sloan's and Sunnyside to Low High. With the exception of the Inca Street Trail on the far eastern side, there are currently no north-south bikeways in northwest Denver, and we're here to change that. So we're adding a bikeway under Lowell Boulevard to make it easier to pass under I-70, we're adding bikeways on Perry, on Irving, Julian, Clay, Tejon, and other north-south routes. And then to fully build out a network, we're going to be adding continuous east-west connections along 46th, 41st between Perry and Inca Street, and continu continuing the bike connection from 23rd to Sloan's. So starting next Monday, you'll be able to see each of these concept designs online and provide your input through a survey. I'm now going to pass the mic to my colleague, Sam. Hi, Geneva. Th thank you very much for uh, passing it along to me. And again, my name is Sam Piper. I'm a, also a transportation planner with Dottie, and I'm the project manager for the South Central Community Transportation Network. Thank you all for taking the time to join us tonight and um, to learn more about the South Central Network in addition to Northwest and Central. So, South Central is actually comprised of 12 Denver neighborhoods, so it's relatively large. It's bordered by downtown on the north, by the Platte River Trail on the west, and then it goes all the way down to Denver's boundary on the southern side. On the eastern part of our network, we actually border um, Franklin Street, so think about Washington Park. That's the street on the east side of Washington Park, and that travels north-south into Cap Hill, and then down south, um, past University and, and Platte Park. So it's a large area, and again, it, it's those 12 neighborhoods. Um, and so similar to um, the fact that my colleagues will be having meetings coming up next week, I did want to highlight that if you're really interested in this area of Denver, I encourage you to join our 
virtual meeting, which is being held Tuesday, June 23rd from 5.30 to 6.30 p.m. So again, that's next Tuesday, so it's coming up quick. So and we really encourage you to join us if you live, um, work, or recreate in this part of town. Um, similar to my colleagues, we did um, calculate, we did have an online input map where we were um, seeking input about all the ways that people move through South Central Denver. And just wanted to highlight quickly that the feedback was a little bit different um, in South Central. When we look at the percentage breakdown of feedback um, through that tool. And that's um, not too surprising because some in some areas of Denver, people do move different ways. And when we look at the percentage of people who use transit, who walk uh, and who bicycle in South Central Denver, we actually see that a higher rate um, walk in South Central Denver, bike in South Central Denver, take transit compared to the rest of the city. So this is definitely an area of town where more people are walking, bicycling, and taking transit. And the key benefits that the projects that we're advancing through South Central Denver are, are listed on this slide. And um, through, the, through the online input map, uh, we learned a lot about what are your ideas and what are your challenges for mobility in South Central Denver. And we're excited because many of the projects that we are advancing and especially those bicycle projects are really seeking to fill gaps and identify or, or, or match up with issues that you've identified through the tool. These include better connections across Spear Boulevard. That was something that became really clear through the tool is Spear Boulevard is a barrier for those who are walking, who are bicycling, or who, who are accessing transit to cross Spear Boulevard. So we'll be looking to improve crossings of that busy corridor. Um, another key thing is we're looking for better east-west connections between Broadway and Washington Park. Um, a lot of the feedback that we gathered through the online tool was concentrated in that part of town. And we actually have three um, bikeway projects, neighborhood bikeways, which are intended to make streets more comfortable for walking and bicycling, um, to create better connections between Broadway and with Washington Park. Um, a lot of the feedback we also heard through the tool was along the Lincoln Corridor. So again, kind of in that West Wash Park neighborhood and know that we do have mobility projects advancing um, along that Lincoln Corridor. So again, a lot of feedback there and we're, we're looking to address that. Um, pivoting kind of to the, to the Northern portion of South Central Denver, we also uh, are looking to uh, fill a gap, a mobility gap, to move people more safely and comfortably north-south through Capitol Hill. Um, really today, there's not a, a dedicated bicycle facility and or a, a route for pedestrians to, to travel um, north-south through Capitol Hill. So we'll be looking to improve that as well as better connections to Cheeseman Park. So. And then just briefly on the, on the southern side of South Central, um, looking to, again, make better north-south connections through the university neighborhood, through Platte Park. And, and again, we're looking at the I-25 corridor. Um, a lot of feedback that we've gathered to date has indicated that there's challenging crossings of I-25 as it swings southwest through this part of town. And so we'll be looking to improve connections. So with that, uh, I wanted to pass it back to Angela. And again, we really appreciate you joining us tonight to learn about this important program. Great, thank you so much, Sam. And we'll be hearing from you again, I'm sure during the Q&A session. So thanks to everybody that has just joined us. We are um, about to take more of your questions, but first I would like to invite anyone who just joined to go ahead and submit your questions now so we can take them during this next Q&A period. And a quick reminder about a couple of items before we head in to get more of your questions. But I wanted to let you all know that you can press star six and share your contact information with the operator tonight to sign up for project updates. If you would like to stay closely connected over the next several months with us, please go ahead and do that. And then another reminder that if you are dialed in by phone and you do have a question for us, we would love to hear from you now. So press star three. 
Those of you that are participating online, go ahead and type your question into the question box on the website. If you're viewing the presentation full screen, you may need to click back to the smaller view in order to access your question box. So I am going to go ahead now and take a question here. It's related to some of the small businesses um, in some of these project area specific corridors and what our plans are to engage with some of the small businesses in these areas. So Geneva, I would like to go ahead and turn that question over to you. Sure, well, first thanks to all of our small business owners. Um, and we are doing our best. We're trying to engage our businesses and our bids in our stakeholder working groups. So really uh, having these smaller groups of folks within each of the networks that knows the area really well and working to get the word out through them. We're often working through our council offices to spread the word. Uh, in Northwest Denver, we are currently handing out flyers and bike maps to our businesses, particularly our restaurants, that they can be um, providing these with, with takeout food and other kind of orders. And in general, we are still early in the process. And right now is, is a key time to receive input and, and to have those conversations with small, small businesses and others who will be uh, impacted from the projects. And this will continue through the rest of the year and certainly in, in, through install. So we're early in the process. Um, don't feel like that we're, we're leaving you behind. If you would still like to stay involved, um, at the end of the presentation, we'll have email addresses and other ways to, to, to stay uh, in the know. So thanks for your question. Okay, great. Sam, I'll be coming your way in just a minute here with a question from another one of our participants online. The question has to do with some of the barriers and some of the challenges with physical barriers um, in some of these neighborhoods that we're looking at for some of these improvements. So specifically, they would like to know what the plan is to make some of these current challenges um, safer for pedestrians and bicyclists. So Sam, could you please go ahead and take that question? Certainly. Yes. And so we, we have several tools in our toolbox to make intersections safer. And we fully recognize that in order to cr create a complete network um, uh, bicycle facilities, we need to make crossing those busier streets more comfortable. And so I'll just talk briefly about some of our um, objectives when we look at large or multi-lane intersections to make them safer and more comfortable for bicyclists and pedestrians. So the first thing that we want to do is we want to increase the visibility that um, bicyclists and pedestrians will be crossing that street. So that could be by marking a crosswalk. And then depending on the street that we're crossing, we have different levels of um, signage or flashing lights or, or sometimes even um, a signal that helps to communicate to um, drivers that people are crossing that roadway. So one of the things that we are evaluating is what is the appropriate type of treatment to help to move people safely across those busier intersections we at the Department of Transportation and Infrastructure, we have guidelines that help um, us as planners and our engineering counterparts determine what is the appropriate treatment at those intersections, but it's really helping to in in increase the visibility. The other thing that we can do is we wanna um, you know, manage speeds at those intersections. So things that we can think about through this program is how can we reduce um, the, the length of those turning movements into and out of the streets, because if we can slow turning movements down, we can increase safety. Speed is directly related to crash severity for our most vulnerable roadway users, including pedestrians and bicyclists. So at intersections, we frequently seek to manage turning speeds to improve safety. So those are just a couple of the things that we look at when we are designing intersections to improve safety for our most vulnerable roadway users and know that we're gonna be really digging into that broad toolbox to come up with the context sensitive solutions that make sense um, on a case by case basis. So we appreciate that question, thank you. Okay, perfect. So we do have another question here. The next couple of questions are, are sort of similar, just talking about some of the plans beyond these three initial areas. So I know that we have outlined tonight some high level information about South Central, 
Central and Northwest. So Jen Hillhouse, I'm going to turn to you and ask you to answer a question here from someone online asking about what are the plans for future areas beyond these first three initial areas? If you could go ahead and answer that. Yeah, that's a great question. Happy to. So although we are focused in these three areas um, from a planning and kind of implementation standpoint from a bike perspective, it doesn't mean that we're not working across the city. Um, so we'll think about these three areas, um, really understand the multimodal network, um, but we're also working in the Northeast um, Montbello uh, we have uh, Peoria Street. We're designing sidewalks uh, right now. We also have bike improvements coming in on 51st and Uvalda um, and Bloville, Darius, Swansea, doing a lot of um, improvements along Washington Corridor. Several of these are a part of our Elevate Bond project um, program, and uh, many of the projects are in plan and design right now. We also have several projects in the southeast um, area of our city, and if you would like to receive more information about those projects, if you could leave your contact information with us and put a note, um, we will certainly reach out as those meetings continue. Um, Elevate Bond Program also has a very robust website that will and, you know, list all projects that are happening, as well as the Dottie website. We have um, really good information about transportation and safety projects across the city. So I don't want you to walk away from this meeting thinking that the city is only focused in these three areas. Um, this is a planning and kind of implementation process, but certainly a lot of work is happening across the city. Okay, great. Thank you, Jen. I think this is actually a good time. There is a similar type of question on the phone from one of our live callers. So Jen, if you wanna stay, stay right there, I think you can probably help us answer this question, but I'm gonna go ahead and ask the, the caller on the phone to um, give us a little more information. Hello, caller, you are now live on the telephone with all of our attendees tonight. Thank you so much for calling. And it looks like you have a similar question to the one that Jennifer Hillhouse was just answering a moment ago. So would you like to share what your question is about some of the equity concerns throughout the various neighborhoods in Denver? Go ahead. Can you hear me? And they may, may not be able to hear me. It looks like that they are, okay, we will try that again in just one minute, but I know that the question was very similar. So um, Jen, we might come back to you in just a minute. Okay, I will come back to that person in just a minute. Hopefully they can call back in because it did not connect for us, but we will get back to that in just a moment. Um, for now, I'm going to go ahead and turn to Riley and ask a similar question. Like I said, two or three of these were very similar. So Riley, the question for you is how will the three areas, so the three different project areas that we've gone through tonight with Central, South Central, and Northwest, what types of improvements and connections are being planned between the three areas? Riley? Thanks, Angela, and that's a great question. Um, one of the very first things that Geneva talked about as she was introducing the the overall goals and purpose of this project is to create complete networks. And so obviously a really important part of that is making sure that all of those networks are completed um, together and that they, that they interact with each other. One of the things I wanted to start with is a recent project that was that is underway and just wrapped up its planning process, which is called Denver Moves Downtown, um, which is recommending a lot of bikeway projects in the downtown area. These projects by nature will actually connect um, and build connections to the Northwest area, to the South Central area, and, and to the Central area. So one of the, the very first things that we we're focused at is making sure that the downtown network is complete um, and then building off of that network as we, as we expand and get outside um, to those surrounding city center neighborhoods. Um, one of the other things I wanted to mention besides just expanding the, the downtown network and, and building those connections is also the recent neighborhood planning initiatives that have gone on where we've heard a lot of different um, feedback from neighbors about projects that don't just involve the South Central neighborhood, but involve the a lot of the, the North 
the neighborhoods in both the central and south central neighborhoods and really being able to create north south connections we've heard that creating those north south connections is critical and that's something that that we're addressing as well so i am often coordinating with with sam and coordinating the two the two networks together to really make sure that our projects are truly connected and interact with each other and that's something that we do is coordinate on a regular basis to make sure that um, that we're we're all thinking about these projects as one and one complete network um, as well instead of just individual projects. The final thing I wanted to mention is that as a part of the funded Elevate Denver Bond program, a lot, one of, a lot of these projects are also creating spines or um, throughout the city in terms of bike infrastructure. And the goals of some of those, those spines or those projects that are funded through the Elevate Denver Bond are to create those connections in between neighborhoods. And those are projects that we'll be continuing to, to design and explore further in this process. Okay, fantastic. So thanks again to everybody that has just joined us. We oftentimes do have some late joiners. So if you have just gotten on online or on the phone tonight, we wanna remind you that if you do have a question for the project team, we are currently taking them. So please, if you're on the phone, go ahead and press star three. Those of you that are participating online can type your question into the question box on the website. Remember, if you're viewing this full screen, you might need to click back to the smaller view in order to access that question box. So please go ahead. We have a few more minutes here that we can take your questions and don't be shy. Go ahead and call in tonight. We would love to hear from you as well. Um, I know we had a caller and they did um, drop off before we were able to hear from them. So. Now I'm going to go ahead and turn to a question here. It's about some of the parking management, specifically um, meter enforcement and ways that we are looking at um, how to incorporate considerations like that into this planning process. So I'm gonna go ahead and ask Sam Piper to help answer that question for us. Sam? Hi Angela, thank you very much for that question. and. I'm kind of reading between the lines that um, one of the projects with it, that could be related to one of the projects in South Central Denver. So we actually developed a survey, um, which we're calling a network verification survey to um, seek feedback from the community on a few different options to move bicyclists and pedestrians north, south through Capitol Hill. One of those projects um, it, in the, pro the corridor, which is identified in Denver Moves, is the Washington and Clarkson corridor. And as we indicated in that survey, um, one of the options would remove parking from one side of both of those corridors. And I wanted to thank anyone on the phone who took that survey. We had a tremendous response rate to it. We had almost a thousand people respond to that survey. In addition to looking at the Washington Clarkson corridor, and we know um, parking is heavily used in Capitol Hill, um, and so we wanted to get feedback on alternative routes. So Ogden is one option to the east. It would be a neighborhood bikeway. Um, there's other options further east, such as Lafayette. And then even west of Washington, there's a corridor. Um, there's a few corridors, Pearl Street. So we wanted to get feedback on if there's a preference from the community on these alternative alignments. And we're still working through the results of that survey. Um, as we determine what next steps are. But one of the things that has become clear through the process is that that impact to parking along Washington and Clarkson is a real concern for the community. And um, so the question is related to a parking management strategy. And simply, yes, we can totally um, look into, uh, you know, kind of leveraging the tools in our toolbox to mitigate the impacts if a parking removal along Washington and Clarkson was the project um, that was going to move forward. And so what I wanted to emphasize this evening is that through the survey, through that 1000 responses, what became clear is that there's a mobility gap for bicyclists and pedestrians to move safely and comfortably north, south through Capitol Hill, but we haven't selected you know, which corridor. We're still seeking feedback and engaging stakeholders on this really critical question about what's the best method to do that. So um, more to come on that question, but quite, you know, I just really wanted to reaffirm that um, we do have tools such as a parking management strategy. We can look at our 
parking meters in the area and, and see if they can be modified to mitigate impacts to um, parking in the neighborhood. So I just wanted to emphasize that and thank you all again for taking that survey. Um, if you have specific questions about that corridor, please make sure to sign up for our mailing list um, so that you can be kept apprised of that and join us next week um, at our South Central meeting and we can talk more about that. So that's Tuesday, the 23rd. Um, please, please join that meeting if you've got more questions about that corridor. Excellent, Sam. You also hit another question that popped up while you were speaking about how to get engaged. So that was a perfect response there. You beat me to it. So that was good timing. We have a question here um, from another person online, and I'm going to hand this one over to Geneva in just a moment. But they are specifically asking about permanent street closures. Um, so Geneva, if you would like to go ahead and help address some of these uh, concerns and questions, it's probably better phrased as an opportunity. So Geneva, go yeah. ahead. Sure. Thanks for your question, Brian. So the currently we're looking at how do we how do we Everyone is using these, these shared streets and loving them and, and asking for them. So what we're trying to do right now is actually kind of pivot and say, there's, a, there's an appetite and really a need for these streets that are calmed and slow and where people feel like they can safely walk and bike and be with their kids and their families. And so the, the really great thing is that we have a whole network of them being planned and designed right now. So I, I know the Northwest Network the best as the planning project manager. We have 15 miles of these streets that we're, we're working on. So that includes Clay and Perry and 41st. And those streets are going to feel different. They're not gonna be quite the same, but they're the, that same idea of how do we really prioritize others from just cars for getting around? And how do we make, make it so those streets feel comfortable for people and that, um, you know, people can take the lane and they don't feel like they're they're over on the side. So that's how we're working to really make sure that all of those open streets are, are turned into healthy streets, or neighborhood bikeways. And that's not just in the Northwest. We have them in Central and South Central as well. Back to you, Angela. Okay, great. So we do have here a couple of questions about transit and whether or not transit is being addressed and how it's being um, considered during the community transportation network planning process. So I'm going to ask Jennifer Hillhouse to go ahead and help answer that question. Jen? Sure, thank you. So yes, the community transportation network is a multimodal planning process. So you're hearing a lot about biking, but you're also hearing from the project managers of all the other great feedback that we've um, gathered from the community as we've been engaging with you. And we know as transportation planners, right, and as, as you know as transportation users, it's very important to think about the entire system together. So whether you're biking, you may be going to a transit station, um, you might be getting off of the bus and needing to hop on your bike to get home. And so all of this works together and it's very important um, to our success to think of, of them as a network. And so we've been getting an amazing amount of feedback on safety, on pedestrian improvements, biking, and transit. We recently completed, and I guess it's been a while now, um, but we, we have our first transit plan as part of the um, suite of plans of Denverite, and so this is kind of setting the vision. There was also a Peds and Trails, a transit, a parks plan, and then a blueprint um, mobility plan. And all of that you know starts to stand up a program and, and identifies the role of the city and transit so a long time you know we've always thought well rtd is our regional transit provider and, and they're going to um, provide transit service we know as a city to meet our goals we have to have a very strong role in transit and so as we take this feedback we'll certainly push that into our existing transit program that we have in the city work to prioritize because we're looking across the city right not just in these three areas and understand what can be implemented and the phasing of that. So those will be upcoming meetings that we start to showcase, you know, what we heard, what we've learned, um, and then how we're prioritizing that work, you know, going after funding, whether that be grants or through capital improvement um, program, and when those could be seen to be implemented. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Jen. I think we have time for a couple of more questions here. So we have a question about 
any plans or ideas about ways to update some of the existing bike maps? And if so, would there be any technology that would be considered to help with some of the um, updates so to make it more accessible for people? So I believe Riley Lamy is going to take that question for us. Riley? Yeah, thanks, Angela. So as a lot of you know, we have a version of the bike map that is in print as well as on the Denver website. That print version of the bike map gets updated about every two to three years just because of the cost of being able to keep it updated in print. Um, one of the things that we are working on though is being able to more regularly update the web-based version of the map. And we are also talking about how we can um, better integrate that into smartphones and things like that. While we don't have that that work completed yet, that is something that we have talked about as, a, as an agency. Um, so we can better make our, our bike information more accessible to the public and not rely just on those paper maps. So more to come on that. Great, thank you, Riley. It looks like we are getting close to the end of our meeting tonight, but we do have time. We're gonna try to take this caller that's been holding with us for a few minutes here. So I'm gonna go ahead and take our caller live. Hi, David, can you hear me? You're on the phone and you're live with us tonight. Yes, I can. Great, thank you can for you? holding. We would love to hear your question that you have about the bus shelters along Colfax Avenue. So go ahead. Actually, I have two questions that are extremely relevant and uh, pertinent to two of our most uh, uh, challenged populations, the elderly and handicapped and uh, senior citizens. Um, why has RTD removed places to sit, such as benches, as well as um, enclosures, uh, like shelters, from the weather, uh, most significantly along Colfax Avenue. This is a severe uh, inconvenience, and um, it's a health issue for RTD customers, especially handicapped senior citizens. While th this has occurred mostly along Colfax and uh, other routes have this seating and, and shelter remaining or added. And this should, this, this is an embarrass, embarrassing um, disservice provided by okay. RTD. What's going on with that? Okay, great. And, and what was your second part to that question? Let's hear that really quick too, so that way we can get them well, both. What's the second part? Several other cities offer a free transportation to residents over 70 years old because they are most vulnerable and have um, a very limited or no income. And I'm wondering okay. if, if RTD is considering that. Okay, well, thank you so much, David. Both really You're important welcome. questions and we appreciate you asking those. Jen Hillhouse, is ready to help answer those questions for you. Jen, go ahead. Those are great um, questions, you know, and I think I have good news for you. So on the, you know, we know the passenger amenities, to your point, are critical to the quality of the ride and, and the experience, and especially for elderly and seniors. Um, right now, RTD is busy working on what we call transit priority along East Colfax, and so this is preempting the signals to allow for buses to pull in front of the traffic and, you know, kind of get out of congestion. Um, so they've been busy in construction uh, since the, the turn of the year, and although those buses stops and benches have been removed for construction they're coming back so good news for you they'll be brand new and shiny um, and offer good places to get out of the weather and places to rest and sit as you're waiting for the bus um, to your second question on free transit for elderly we are working with RTD pretty closely on 
um, what the options are for this, you know, and then COVID hit. So I know the financial constraints are really real um, for RTD and, and for the city and, and really for all of us, right? So I think things could change, but we were working with them on a, my Denver card, which looked at youth as well as elderly, um, and we could push out additional information as those things are firmed up, but certainly in conversations, and we understand those tools and um, incentives are important as we think about our mobility goals. Thank you, Jen, and thank you, David, so much for participating and calling in tonight. And I just want to quickly thank everyone that did have questions for us. And I'm sorry if we were not able to get to your question tonight, but this does conclude the portion of our second Q&A session. But remember that we would still like to hear your questions and would be happy to get back to them in the coming days. So you are able to provide those um, through the project website. And we'll show that information to you in just a moment. Before I do, I would like to talk a little bit more about um, where we currently are in the process. So we're going to take a quick look at the project timeline. So currently, we're in the plan phase of the Community Transportation Network. And you can see up on the screen there that within that phase, the project teams are collecting and analyzing feedback from the community to help develop concepts that we will take to design beginning later this summer. So remember, your input is extremely valuable in this process, and we ask that you please take time to participate in a survey that we are soon to publish. Um, it'll be available on the project website approximately starting um, June 22nd until mid-July. So please make sure to go to the project website and um, participate in that that survey for us before we head into the design phase that would be extremely helpful. So I just want to go ahead and show you a couple of different ways and another reminder about some of the upcoming meetings that we have. Um, this does actually conclude our presentation for tonight. So please take a look at the screen and look at how you can stay engaged and provide input and some of the upcoming meetings that we'll be holding in your specific area. And remember that the presentation from tonight will be posted on www.ctnvirtualopenhouse.com in just a couple days. And you can also visit the website at bit.ly forward slash Denver Moves Networks to learn more about these three community transportation networks. Just would like to thank everyone again. We really appreciate your time this evening. Stay well, Denver.